My good friend Armand Martin from Zurich, Switzerland, is in is putting the finishing touches to a groundbreaking, an amazing intellectual adventure of a book titled The Quantum Divine Nexus: A Journey to Unify Science and Spirituality to Unveil Life's Purpose. It is a fascinating tome, and I won't provide you with spoilers. Um, but suffice it to say that it provides indeed a nexus between spirituality and science in a way that, to the best of my knowledge, has never been done before. And it explores religion, or shall I say religions, um, again in a kind of a scientific way, with emphasis, by the way, on Islam. So, I've said enough, I've said too much, <laughs> Maybe uh, the book will be out soon and you'll be able to find out for yourselves. We have been corresponding and discussing the book throughout the past few weeks and several interesting issues have arisen. One of them is the nature of consciousness and the other is God. God is a universal observer. And all this has to do with the chronon field theory originally proposed by me in 1982 in my PhD dissertation and later developed unrecognizably by Eitan Suchard, who also endowed it with a geometric language. So the chronon field theory. And these are the topics of today's video. I would like to actually read to you portions of the correspondence between me and Arman, and I would like to start with the issue of consciousness. Now, uh, in the chronon field theory, there is the presumption that of the existence of a universal observer. I will go into it in the second part of this video. Let us just say that there is a universal observer and that the act of observation, the act of measurement of this universal observer brings, the, brings reality, brings the world into existence. That's, of course, the metaphysics of the physics of chronon field theory. And then the question arises, is this universal observer a type of consciousness? Or is it a type of, shall we say, automatic device, like in a laboratory? And I, again, I will dwell and I will deal with these questions in the second half of this video. At this stage, what I want to discuss is consciousness. Anything created by a conscious observer, in my view, must be conscious. In other words, anything, any object, any organism, any uh, constellation of matter that is put together by a cognizant, sentient, conscious observer whose act of observation and measurement bring these entities into being, must possess consciousness. In other words, it is my belief that consciousness is an extensive property, an extensive parameter of the world as we know it. It is not limited to intelligent beings, such as human beings or artificial intelligence in the future. The linkage between consciousness and intelligence is precarious and, in my view, not well established. And so, I think consciousness, exactly like intelligence, is something that characterizes every arrangement of molecules in the universe that displays order and structure and has been brought into being via the act of observation in measurement, adhering to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And why do I believe this? Because the creator's mind, if you wish, in all its dimensions and traits and characteristics, this mind is invariably embedded in and reflected in the creation. The creator is in the creation. It's easy to prove this because we can reverse engineer any creation to reveal the mind of the creator. Even inanimate objects are conscious in the sense that they contain information about the creator's mind. 
Of course, this immediately raises the conundrum of active consciousness versus passive consciousness. The conscious mind of the of the creator is is ubiquitous, is all pervasive, it's everywhere in his or her creations. That much is true and cannot be denied. But this is a kind of passive consciousness. That's the that's one of the arguments, uh, and I think it's wrong. I think it's a wrong argument. We'll come to it in a minute. Suffice it to say at this stage that there is no debate that the mind of the creator is utterly captured in his or her creations. And so meaning is the interaction between anything and an observer. Remember this topic, two postulates. The creator, the creation reflects the creator's mind captures it somehow, encapsulates it. The second theorem, or the second postulate, meaning is the interaction between anything and the observer that brings it into being. Okay, so what is the meaning of your, I don't know, watch or your smartphone? Your observations of these objects give them their only meaning. It is only when you observe the watch that the watch acquires meaning. It is only when you interact with your smartphone that the smartphone acquires meaning. Meaning, therefore, is the intersubjective space, if you wish, <laughs> or in the space between subject and object, in the case of inanimate objects. It is in the space. It is not an intrinsic innate quality of the of the observer or the observed the creator or the creation it is in the interaction between them that meaning arises of course the creator embeds the potential for meaning in these objects there is a potential there for the rise of meaning for the emergence of meaning following an interaction and you're beginning to see the philosophical foundations of chronon field theory, where the field is a field of potentials, and then it eventuates via observation. Someone observes the field, and the potential potentials become events. Atomic particles are events. So it's not a perturbation in the field, it's a translation or a conversion of the field from potential to event. And this conversion is the outcome of interaction between the observer and the observed. Although, as we will discuss in a minute, the observer is immanent. It is the observed in chronon field theory. But I'm going, I'm going easy on you. Start with basics. And so similarly, the meaning of human life is granted by the creator of human life and only by him. And mind you, I'm an agnostic. I believe that hard atheism is a form of faith. It's another religion. So I'm not an atheist and I'm definitely not a religious person. <laughs> I have a very dim view of religions and uh, entities such as God and angels and all this, what I consider to be rank nonsense. But um, there is no denying the ingrained structural relationship between meaning, observer, and observed. So there's a human life, and someone must have observed this human life into being. And I'm not talking about the process of conception or embryology. I'm talking about the very possibility of conceiving, the very emergence of matter, the permutations of matter, the complexities of matter, are immaterial. What, what is the critical question is, how did matter arise? How does something, how does something come into being from ostensible nothingness? And so there the observer is critical. It is the observer's gaze. It is the act of observation. It is the act of measurement that gives rise to everything, human life included. So that's why I say that the meaning of human life 
is granted by the creator of everything, and human life included, and only by him or it or whatever you want to call it. In the chronon field theory, the creator is the field, but we'll discuss it in a minute. And so consciousness is the awareness of this meaning. When we are aware of this meaning, we are conscious. Back to inanimate objects. How can a smartphone be conscious, therefore? Surely it is not aware. Let's retrace a bit. I'm saying that interactions between observers and observed give rise to meaning, and that awareness of this meaning is what we call consciousness. But smartphones are incapable of awareness. So even if they are endowed with, with, with meaning, they will never be conscious. Well, that's not true. Smartphones are fully aware. Any object, anything, animate or inanimate, is fully aware. Let me explain what I mean. That sounds really wacky. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean. The smartphone's awareness to the observations of its creator, which is us, this awareness is programmed into the smartphone. You could think, you could, you could imagine the smartphone as a metaphor, okay? We are the creators, the smartphone is a creation, and we endow the smartphone with awareness. But this awareness is triggered comes to the surface only when we observe the smartphone. We, the creators of the smartphone, must observe the smartphone in order for any, for, in order for any meaning to emerge. The minute you observe the smartphone, the smartphone is programmed to become aware of your gaze and respond to you, its creator. You're beginning to see the the similes and the metaphors. So the smartphone is programmed, programmed to spot the observer's observation or measurement. And the minute this happens, the smartphone collapses into being, becomes aware of the creator, or more precisely the creator's observation, or the observer's observation, and then becomes imbued with meaning many types of meaning actually and so the smartphone becomes meaningful as a consequence of the observation or the measurement affected by the creator of the smartphone we similarly we human beings are programmed to respond to the gaze of our creator to his observations of us. The same way a smartphone reacts to its creator, we react to our creator. When we are observed by the, this creator, we come into being, we wake up, so to speak, and we are fulfilled with meaning. We become aware of this meaning, and this is what we call consciousness. The creator's gaze the Creator's observations of us endow us with meaning. And consciousness is how we experience this meaning. It's the internal experience of this meaning. Consciousness is, in other words, how we experience the gaze of our Creator. How we experience being observed by this Creator. When the Creator observes us, it is then that we come into being. It is then that we acquire meaning. It is then that we experience this meaning. And it is and it is this experience that is called consciousness. And what are we conscious of? We are conscious of the Creator's gaze. We are conscious of the observation that has brought us into being, that has made us become, that has rendered us entities. And we become, through the observation of the Creator, not only physically, but also psychologically. Consciousness 
is how we experience the process of becoming via the Creator's observation of us, via the Creator's gaze. We internalize this observer. Another way to look at consciousness is to say that it is the awareness of this internal observer, which links beautifully with psychology, where we are beginning to realize that there is always some kind of internal observer inside. And so this is what I had to say about consciousness. I want to say, I want to disclaim once more, just about the only topic I'm irrational about is faith. <laughs> I'm irrational about faith. Of course, I have faith in the scientific method. I have faith in logic and reasoning. To some extent, I have faith in math or arithmetic. So when I say that I'm rejecting any kind of faith, it is not true. Because it's not true, it's not rational. And when I deal with the implications of Recronon field theory, Recronon field theory is a theory in physics. It involves extremely complex mathematics, although the philosophy of Cronon field theory is very, very, very simple. And it contains minimal assumptions that give rise to all of physics. Still, it's a theory in physics. It's not theology. It's not philosophy. It's not even metaphysics. And yet, Whenever we come across a theory in physics, for example, quantum mechanics, we immediately ask, what does it say about the world, about reality, about the possibility of some divine intelligence? Does, do these theories in physics, can they inform us about something which transcends physics, about the metaphysics? And Cronon field theory is not an exception. Because you see, in Cronon, in Cronon field theory, I mean, Cronon field theory is, as I said, the foundation, it's physics, but it gives rise and it provides proof positive, mathematical, <laughs> of the existence of a universal observer. So Cronon field theory um, created in me a state of deep dissonance because you cannot avoid the implications that there is a universal observer that brings the universe, brings reality into being. I keep telling myself that this observer is the chronon field itself. Chronon field is the field of time with a big T, not the time we measure with watches, but the abstract concept of time. So, chronon field is the time field. And I keep telling myself, this universal observer is the time field itself. There's no need for an assumption of an external observer, of God. It's, this is non-parsimonious. It defies Occam's razor. So, it must be wrong. But then, there's a problem of consciousness. Coming back to the to the way I started this video, I opened this video. The problem of consciousness is this observer, universal observer, conscious or unconscious or not conscious. And this time from the philosophical point of view, from the metaphysical point of view, I, and based of course on formalisms such as quantum mechanics, formalism of quantum mechanics, and definitely the formalism of the chronon field theory, it seems to me that assuming the existence of a conscious, non-random observer who brings the time field into being and is actually the time field, this assumption has much more explanatory power and therefore by definition is more aesthetic and more parsimonious then the assumption that the observer is non-conscious and random. In other words, when I make an assumption that the observer, this universal observer, 
is conscious and non-random, I get faster, better, more comprehensive outcomes, results, without, in fewer steps and without involving any additional conceptual entities, which is the hallmark of good science. I regard science and spirituality as two languages, but there's no denying that they both refer and discuss the same, the very same things. If these two are two languages, spirituality and science, then in principle we could construct a bilingual dictionary which would allow us to translate from one language to the other. The Cronon field theory, as I had conceived it originally in 1982, was about seeing reality through the eyes and through the mind of a universal observer. This universal observer brings everything into being, eventuates everything via his infinite observations. So this act of infinite observation brings everything into being. When I started my work in 1982, I asked myself, all theories of physics hitherto are man-made. They are about how we perceive and see reality. But if God were the one to write the manual for his creation, I mean, assuming there's a God, yeah, to write the manual for his creation, if God were the physicist, the ultimate physicist, how would the theory look? And... I came up with Cronon field theory. It is a theory of everything, of course. In the Cronon field theory, there's a duality. Duality of potential and event. The field itself is a field of potentials. And it eventuates, but it eventuates through the act of observation and measurement of a universal observer. This duality of potential event is very reminiscent of the wave-particle duality. And indeed, the wave-particle duality is one private case of the potential event duality. And again, the only debate is whether this universal privileged observer, let's call it the universe, must be conscious or not. My view is that, yes, this universal observer must be conscious. But I think the problem is semantic. When I say conscious in this sense, it's not the kind of consciousness in the human or even non-human sense. Consciousness, when I use the word consciousness in, in the metaphysics of Cronon field theory, it is a simultaneous awareness of all the potentials and all the events, all the collapses of the superpositions. It is the time field actualizing itself, transitioning from potentials to events all at once. It is a superposition of all the potentials and all the events. This is what I call consciousness. And so the conscious observer, this privileged universal observer or measurer, it's required in order to collapse this universal wave function into what we call reality as we know it. Only a conscious observer can measure the field itself. Only a conscious observer can observe the field itself. Because the observer in non-field theory, this universal observer, is the field. So the field is self-aware. For the field itself to observe itself, it must have consciousness. It must be self-aware. The act of, of, of observation, the act of measurement, is innate. It's immanent. It is the field that is observing itself. It is the field that is measuring itself. But these actions are intimately associated with awareness, with consciousness. While it is arguable whether an unconscious lab device, device in a laboratory, can collapse specific superpositions via acts of measurement, it is easy to prove, even mathematically, that no infinite amount of unconscious lab devices could collapse 
all the wave functions in a total field. Let me repeat this. A single lab instrument, a single lab instrument, maybe can collapse a specific superposition into being in, and collapse the wave function so that we can affect a measurement. Even that is highly debatable because we would interpret this data later on, a conscious being. But leave it aside from it. Let's assume that a single lab instrument is capable of affecting observation and measurement and bringing into existence, for example, an elementary particle. This device, of course, is non-conscious. There's no awareness. But it is easy to prove, mathematically, by the way, philosophically, that if you take an infinite amount of non-conscious lab instruments and put them together, they, are, they would never be able to collapse all the wave functions in a total field. This emerges mathematically from the work of Kurt Gödel, the incomplete, incompleteness theorems of Kurt Gödel. It will take... So this is one problem, the incompleteness theorem. The other problem is it would take much more than the time of the existence of the universe until it experiences heat death. <laughs> so it simply can't happen. The devices, the, these lab instruments must be conscious. The observer, the universal privileged observer must be conscious in order to eventuate or effectuate the totality of the time field. Moreover, who or what would measure bring into collapse the lab instrument themselves? Even if we decide that we can put together an infinite number of lab instruments and they would do the job, they would collapse the universe for us. But who would collapse them? Ultimately, even though they are macroscopic objects, still they are the outcomes of multiple collapses. Who or what would measure the, these lab instruments? Who or, or what would observe these lab instruments? Who or what would collapse, would, would engender a sufficient number of collapses to yield these lab instruments? Uh, in the case when, when there's no observer external to the field and there's no infinite regression of observers, each observer observing the other observer, yeah? It's difficult to argue that the observation, the act of observation or measurement is non-conscious. And so the collapse of the field, collapse of the time field, collapse of a chronon field, must be imminent. It must be an inside job, if you wish. There must be an identity between the field and the observer. They are the one, they are one and the same. The universal privileged observer's consciousness is the field. Is the field coming into self-awareness, so to speak, via the act of eventuation, the transition from potentials to events, to actualized events, is actually uh, wake, uh, uh, an act of awakening, an act of self of awareness. But of course, there's no beginning and end to this. It's not like um, the observer has been unconscious or unaware or asleep or something, and then woke up and eventuated the field and became aware or self-aware. That's all what I'm saying. I'm saying that awareness and consciousness are intricately integrated with the very fabric of the time field. There would have been no time field without self-awareness of the field, without consciousness. The time field is in a constant state of disequilibrium. Potentials keep becoming events. Order and structure keep emerging and increasing in pockets, in pockets of the time field, all the time, so to speak, and overall. And this implies the existence of a conscious universal observer, which keeps creating events, 
via its acts of observation. In chronon field theory, the observer is imminent. It is one and the same with the observed, with the time field. But it doesn't, this doesn't vitiate the fact that the field is observing itself. Field is measuring itself and therefore must be self-aware and therefore must be conscious. There is therefore no design involved in the chronon field theory. It's not a religious theory. There's no creationism there. There's no designer. There's no watchmaker. There's no design involved. But there is constant non-random creation via a preference for collapse-inducing observations and measurements. It's kind of inbuilt asymmetry. Collapse-inducing creative acts of observation and measurement are preferred. It's a little like matter and antimatter, where matter is preferred. This preference is non-random. In other words, it must involve some kind of force, some kind of will, if you wish. Science, of course, is non-teleological. We don't allow teleology. Science never incorporates concepts such as design, intent or intention, direction, will, planning. There's no place for any of this in science. This is metaphysics or philosophy. But science also follows the evidence where it leads and makes use of tools of syllogism and logic and that are, cannot be just cast aside when the outcome is uncomfortable. Had the universal observer been unconscious, there could have never been order and structure to the universe. Random fluctuations, perturbations, from potentials to events and back, would have created a state of permanent equilibrium indistinguishable from entropy. So the very fact that this is not the case is a very powerful proof of the existence of some kind of non-random process, asymmetrical process, a process with preference, preferential process. And these usually are associated with a mind some kind of mind, artificial or not, doesn't matter, animate or not, doesn't matter. But these are associated with a mind, awareness, and consciousness, even in inanimate objects, as I've demonstrated. This is a very strong argument from physics, statistical thermodynamics and statistical dynamics, for the existence of a conscious, privileged, universal, non-random observer. In chronon field theory, the field is its own observer. We don't have an external observer. And this is the physics. But this observer must be, as I said, random and non-random, I'm sorry, and conscious. And this is the metaphysics. If you insist on translating this into a religious language, which is just, as I said, the flip coin of science, it's just another language. It uses different methodology. Faith is not reason, of course. But it's still an attempt to explicate reality. It's a hermeneutic attempt. So, if you wish to translate everything I said to a religious language, let's say, God is the time field. All of us are events. We are realized, eventuated potentials in the time field, within God. And where is all this happening? Within God. Within God's mind, if you wish. These are all metaphors, of course. God, if there is a God, doesn't have a mind. But it, it's happening immanently, within, not from without. And this is a very compelling religious view. God is not external to creation. God is creation. God is the field. We are all realized potentials in God's mind, the chronon field, the time field. The field, God, is not coming from anywhere and not going anywhere. The time field has no beginning, has no end, 
Of course, the time field, by definition, is timeless. The time field has not been created. It is the only source of creation. Only within the time field can and do potentials become events. There's no eventuation outside the time field. So there's no external observer. There's no beginning and end. There's no before and after. Only within God in a religious language can and do we become. And what is free will in this sense? Free will is the residue, the relic or the remnant of our primordial state as potentials in a universe-wide superposition. Everything and everyone, we are objects after all, everything and everyone used to be a potential and then became an event eventuated, actualized, realized. But initially we were all potentials. And in this state of potential, as, as a potential, you have an infinite will. Because you are interlaced, you're integrated with the totality of the field. Um, you are part of God, if you want to use a religious language. And so in this universe-wide or reality-wide or, or field-wide or God-wide superposition, everything is possible. Everything is possible. And because everything is possible, you have free will. Free will is simply the space of all potentials. Free will survives this potential state and characterizes us when we are eventuated. We used to be potentials in a universe-wide superposition. Our free will was infinite. Then we collapsed into an event within God, the universal conscious observer, whose observation and measurement brought us into being. But we retained the free will from our previous state as potentials. This is, by the way, a view of quite a few religions. The Kabbalah says that we have an obligation, obligation towards God, because God cannot be healed, cannot be rendered complete without us. This makes sense only if we are within God. And God is not an outsider, an external entity, or a mere watchman, or a mere observer. The dream metaphor, that we are God's dream, is beautiful and poetic, but I don't think it's correct. Dreams are often disjointed, non-linear, even impossible, so realistic. And it doesn't sit well with quantum mechanics and with the Cronon field theory. I don't think it's a dream state. I think the universal observer has to be aware. Aware. It is not awareness in the human sense, like observing myself. The universal observer does not observe itself. So it's not this kind of awareness. But the universal observer's existence or being is so total that there is no place for it to not be aware. And so the universal observer has to be aware in order to choose to make a measurement. After all, measurements and observations are volitional acts. Even when you are a universal, privileged, total observer, or even when you are the field, there must be some stage preceding the measurement or the observation, the stage that leads to the observation and measurement. We call it will. And so the universal observer has to be aware in order to choose to make a measurement, to collapse the wave function or the superposition, or in chronon field theory, to eventuate a potential. In all monotheistic religions, God creates knowingly, intentionally, and has a master plan. Logos, that is how the New Testament starts. Speech is the first divine act of Genesis. A much more aesthetic, parsimonious and compelling view is that God is the field within which we all become via his divine observation of us and himself. In himself immanently, not as an external observer, but as an inescapable total presence. 
God observes us into becoming. God realizes our potentials. God makes us be via him. And so I'm using religious language, of course, not because I'm a religious person. I'm vehemently not a religious person. I'm just trying to translate it for religious people. In Judaism, is the concept of Hashgacha. In the Asharia school, in Islam, God is conscious and predetermines the world. He is the only one endowed with the ability to create anything at all. And the Quran field theory is not moving anywhere, it's not flowing, it's not new Newtonian. The time of the Quran field, theory, uh, field is there. It was Newton, Newton's view that time is a river which flows. That's not Quran field, field theory. The time field is just there, an infinite field of potentials, which potentials which eventuate, become events when observed by a universal observer. So a much better metaphor in this sense is an ocean. Time is imminent. It permeates reality. It's ubiquitous. It's all pervasive. But time is the only reality. Time is reality waiting to happen, a potential, once it is observed and becomes an event. And who is the observer? This universal, privileged a process that makes everything eventuate? It's the field itself. But because the field is has no time, no beginning, no end, it is highly resonant and reminiscent with the concept of God in monotheistic religions, at least. And that's where Alman Mautern's book um, uses insights from physics and biology and many other disciplines to try to bridge this ostensible, fallacious gap between how science sees the world and how religion or spirituality see the world. I think, as I said, these are two languages. We are simply using different names, essentially for the very same things. I'm looking forward to Alman's book because it's very well argued and relies on cutting edge research. I think it should provoke at the very least a conversation.